S-Class Mercedes was the pinnacle of motoring, really. I think different manufacturers deal with it in different ways. And I think Ferrari probably deal with it better than anyone now because they, they really, they let the sellers or the buyers know how they're handling them. So you have to buy X, Y, and Z. Jensen Interceptor, seven and whatever lesion. And I just think it's such a beautiful car. And I think, you know, I don't think, has anyone made anything like that since? Hello and welcome to another Collecting Addicts podcast. I'm told this is the 30th episode. What a milestone. Um, Manish is on holiday somewhere in West Wales. The rest of us, I think, are in the UK. Uh, although Chris Cooper seems to be sitting in front of a blue light bulb. We don't know why. I don't know why he looks out. like that. Um, he's not blue. Um, oh, look, look. What stylish sunnies he's got as well. No F1 this week, uh, which stops us all being a bit negative and being accused of being anti-Max when we're not. We're going to start this week with an observation that I made. It's not normal for me to actually come up with these topics. It's Neil, because he's, he's clever and he thinks more about the subject of cars. But I was driving to London last week and I saw a lot of Mercedes S-Classes. Now, when I started in my professional capacity as a journalist, the S-Class Mercedes was the pinnacle of motoring, really. It was the car on which the most attention, money, expertise and genius had been um, grafted. It, it was just the best motor car in the world. But I now view them differently. I see them as private hire vehicles. And I wonder whether my learned colleagues think so as well. I just don't, I don't see anyone driving an S-Class in a private capacity anymore. What do you think, Chris Cooper? Um, well, I think you're right. Um, there's somebody that we know that does drive one. Botty Gravy. Ah. But we can't yeah. really say who that is, otherwise no. we, you and I Botty would Botty Gravy. Yeah, yeah moving on. Um, I think you can blame Richard Branson for this because about 30 years ago, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less, quite a while ago, he set up a limo business called Tri, or was a partner in a limo business called TriStar Cars. Yeah. And they provided probably Merck E-Class, some Range Rovers. You, some of you might remember, he had quite a nasty accident Range on a dual carriage somewhere in a Range Rover Classic. And he said it was such a safe vehicle. It wasn't that safe. Um, his limo company would buy lots of Range Rovers. And I was, I was working with Air New Zealand at the time when I was a pup consultant going back and forwards to New Zealand. And Air New Zealand used TriStar cars. I thought, this is an interesting phenomenon. It's quite a posh limo company. Not like sort of, because limos those days were like limos, like big American Yankee sort of, and similar sort of things. So at the point where those companies started to sort of get bigger and bigger, a murky class was quite a cool thing. But because there was lots of competition, they all, they all ended up, they all tend to the same place. So I think we can blame Richard Branson because the idea of a posh car rather than a limo limo service kind of started it. So the alongside that, there was clearly the phenomenon of the, the posh SUV. And I can, you know, we can all remember, I remember a fantastic BMW 7 Series advert. It would have been the E, what was the last shark nose one, 7 Series? 32. E32, that's right. And the advert was, the luxury car is dead, long live the luxury oh, car. Sure. And we all aspire to that stuff. And apart from our friend Botty Gravy, I don't know that anybody does. So I think they are now posh taxis. And I think I'd like to blame Richard Branson for that. So uh, I think they are posh taxis now. And you can draw, go back to Genesis, which I think was probably about 30 years ago, when they started to be used for ferrying expensive people to airports to sit in the expensive end of the aircraft much like edward's about to do this evening but what one thing chris do you think the advent of a diesel engine in an s-class accelerated that process that's a really, I good, what a really good, good question point. very good question because suddenly you've got these taxis where they can buy a very small diesel engine and a great big chassis it isn't just going to the airport this thing's going to work for 200 yeah. 250 miles and that's just going to head either east or southeast. So suddenly every single that's probably taxi quite fair. Yeah. diesel Mercedes. Yeah, that's probably a fair point. The I think three, it's a... The 320 diesel S-Class definitely changed everything because it suddenly yeah. had a range of 750 miles and, and you didn't have the big V8 in it. 
Um, well, Edward, what do you think? You sit in the back of these things regularly in your high-powered executive capacity. <laughs> well, it's funny. So as a car salesman back in the day, you know, selling a 7 Series or an S-Class was a very challenging thing to do. And it was really the sort of the local landowner might own one. But BMW and Mercedes always used to push the dealers very hard to try and sell these things, giving all sorts of incentives. And, and I, I was convinced there was going to become a time where these super saloons were going to be killed off. And actually, I think just to be clear, when you're saying that the S-Class is now a fancy taxi, that's not necessarily a bad thing, is it? Because I think I'd prefer to be in one of those than I would in a um, Prius or something like that. No, I, I, I think it's a, it's a good thing for those to get to sit in the back of them because they're, you know, the current they're really nice. is a brilliant yeah. place to sit. But I think it, what it does do is it removes, it removes some of the glory of the S-Class badge yeah. for me. It, that, that, it, that, that, that's, fair, that's fair enough. And I think, the, obviously, given where you live in the world probably also denotes where you see these things being used as cars. And in, in North America, you know, these things are being used as daily drivers for a lot of people because you go in, you take them on a lease for a year or 18 months. And a lot of people are driving S-Classes, 7 Series, you know, Bentley, um, um, Mulsans, etc. But I, I think in the UK in general, it's just uh, the super saloon is not really the car that people buy as a pri as a private wagon anymore. So there's one other thing. Which was the series that was a mid '80s one? It became sort of um, it came after the one. The one one six was the most beautiful. The, one, the original two, kind of one two six. Yeah, the one, yeah. one the two, six. two six. So my dad's generation of Californian doctors all lusted after that one. And then do you remember? I think it's the one forty that came that was very yeah. boxy. The Panzer. Suddenly became yeah. So, but that car was crazy money. I remember that car because they all went, oh, hold on a minute. And suddenly every kind of Indian doctor in Southern California was driving a, an LX 400. Yeah. So there, there was something about them being, I mean, they were kind of affordable, beautiful. And then I remember that 140 came along and no one bought it. It was so expensive. I mean, I can't remember how that many the first dollars. Time they did a, that's the first time they did a 600 SEL. Yeah. Yes. And that was they threw the kitchen sink at that, and it oh, was a magic car. Being a third yeah, fantastic car. Yeah, we've talked about I, it before. Yeah, it's it, fantastic. And I, uh, Edward's uh, points on the geography of these cars is really interesting because you're right. In North America, I remember when we were filming a year ago in Florida, I was at some out of town shopping place where there was a breakfast bar, and a, and a, a woman turned up to have breakfast. She turned up in a proper beige, metallic beige. <laughs> brand new S600, whatever it was, um, mm. clear glass, just to go and have breakfast. And she drove away again. I just thought that that is the craziest daily driver I've ever seen. But if you've retired to Palm Springs or something, it's entirely conceivable that you would drive one. Whereas over here, I mean, I thought Mercedes would never share the, the numbers, but how many private punters walk into a Mercedes showroom and say, I'd like an S500 or whatever it is as my car, and I'm going to pay for I'm going to write a check for it. Um, and I'll and I might sell it back to you in two years' time. I, I'm not sure that person even exists, yeah. or do they? Somewhere between pro none and not very many. Yeah. Pro prob probably not. But just to go back to my original point, I think I thought they were going to die, and I'm sure they're all selling more of them now than they thought they would have been ten years ago. Which think, for them has got to be a great but, success. And I suppose next, manufacturers next don't manufacturers don't want to build cheap cars anymore. Well, no, and my, I totally agree. My next question is. Um, so if if the the S class in the UK is almost a commercial vehicle now, it is. And when you get into a commercial vehicle, the thing about the design of those products is it's you know the intended use is at the forefront of what that car or that vehicle is going to do. And I lo we all love that. You know, when you get into a van, there's always a, there's always something about the van that makes you think, well, that was clever the way that door opens, or that's going to make the, the operator's life easier. So are we going to get to the stage where actually the driver becomes unimportant in an S-Class? Because it doesn't need to be enjoyable to drive. It just needs to be, they need to be able to drive it because the person yeah. in the back is ultimately the client. Yeah. So, you know, I find it really weird because the S-Class, a lot of it was about dynamics. They spent a lot of time making sure the car drove well. But it just needs to be comfortable and quiet now, doesn't it? There was a sweet spot, wasn't there? There was some sort of, there's another graph in here we need to draw. I think we, graphs are going to be our little sort of motif, aren't they? There's a graph in here where 
we would all have aspired. I remember I did think about buying one once. It must have been quite a while ago, about 20 years ago. And I was looking for a CLK convertible, 430. Um, six series convertible wasn't available then, so needs must. Did you just say that in public? I did just say that, yeah. I had CLK 430. You're a brave man, Mr. That's C. That's a fantastic I love you, I love you CLK. You're a brave man. Well, Fit. you know. Um, hashtag brave. Um, I And there was the dealer, it was the BMW dealer, Rivervale, in Brighton, not BMW, uh, Mercedes dealer. And they had an S430 in the showroom. Same engine as the one I was looking at, CLK. And I thought, do you know what? That's quite nice. Because I used to have saloon cars. I had saloon cars until probably just uh, like a three box four door saloon car is my is my car until probably quite a while and so I th but i can't imagine after that the 140 which was obviously in the early 90s that panzer one was amazing but you couldn't have imagined driving it yourself so i just and then suv's taken over range rovers have taken over x5 took over all that kind of stuff um I've Neil got Clifford, someone Neil else Clifford. to blame. Yeah, no, Clifford, you, you've not said anything about this. Come on, tell us what you've got to oh, say. No, no, I'm bloody yes, waiting for you lot to shut up. Yeah, go on. Um, <laughs> I can carry on if you want. No, no, no. I, I, blame, the, I blame the Americans. I, I blame the Daimler-Chrysler merger for this because I was brought up on reading Car Magazine and the world's best car article, which was Jaguar, yeah. BMW, Mercedes... Yeah and Bentley or Roller or whatever. And, they, they and were, Setrite. Uh, Setrite would be there yes. with his beard out. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to be referring to a Setrite book later. And, and yes, a beautiful photography. It was a sunset over North Wales or the Brecon Beacons or wherever. And more often than not, the Mercedes won. Yeah. The, Jaguar, the Jag, actually, XJ12 won quite often, didn't it? Even back to the Series 3. Yeah. But if you think about, I've owned all of them. 109, you know, the 6.3... I've owned the 116, the 6.9, the 126, 560 SEL, because they were always deemed. Did yours have electric rear seats, your 560? Yes. Oh. And, and, and Velour. Oh. In, 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 That's um, posh. Smoke, 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 silver, metallic, you know, with a slight bit of brown in it. Yeah, yeah. lovely. And all the way up, I haven't had a one. I did, actually. Off Robert Hughes Automotive, 6,000 miles from new, a 140. Navy blue with tan, 600 SEL for 12 grand. God, I wish I hadn't sold that. But then, then comes along, what is it, the 220, wasn't it? Mm. And it basically got slammed as a shit car. It wasn't as good as the others. It wasn't as good as a BMW because the Americans fucked it all up, didn't they? And I don't think the S-Class has really recovered from that, certainly in my eyes. That's a good I, point. Um, that was a shockingly disastrous merger. It was. Yeah. Uh, I think, um, but even those looking back, was it the 220 was the sort of late 90s to early yes, noughties one? Early yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it lost out on build quality, but it was still the most comfortable saloon car. There's never been an S-Class that's been bettered for ride comfort or, or cabin quietness for me ever by a rival from Audi or BMW. I've just haven't driven a car that can do it as well. Even when they were, it, so a shit S class was still better than the rivals for me. Um, but, I, but it is remarkable just to see so many of these things just heading to the airport. It's, it's, I suppose it's the equivalent of when Max Power in the early noughties were t ripping the piss out of Burberry and they, um, and they did, they, uh, Johnny Smith brilliantly, Painted a Ford, Ca uh, sorry, a Vauxhall Cavalier oh. in Burberry oh. colours, and they drove oh. it past. They, dr I discussed it with Johnny on his po podcast thing. They drove it past the Burberry headquarters in Knightsbridge, and it was called the Cavalier. The Cavalier was called the Cavalier, <laughs> and the next day, the boss, the lawyers from Burberry came, turned up at Bauer Media just to say this is damaging to our brand. This idea that you know, for for many. On, on the football terraces, those Burberry caps with yeah. the, the uniform. And Burberry quite rightly realised that was an existential threat to their yeah. very existence because yeah. it was being debased. And I, when, if I was Mercedes in the UK, I'd be saying, we're, we're selling a lot of these, it's good news. But, but, what, but it, this is supposed to be our flagship vehicle. Yeah. And, it's, and it just appears to just be a taxi. It's equivalent of when you saw in that period, that, that sort of Chavalier period, when pubs... 
around Millwall football ground or in other parts of London had chalked on the blackboard outside, no Burberry. Did they? Meaning yeah. they didn't Did want they? fans yeah. of that sort in there. You know, we're in a spot of bother. I did. We're in a spot of bother. Dear um, me. Okay, well, look. I who think was the supermodel who rescued Burberry? It wasn't Cara Delevingne, was it? No, it, no, it wasn't the Rose model. Marie, it was Rosemary Bravo. Yeah. Rosemary Bravo. A mate of mine worked with the CEO, uh, Angela Arendt. Arendt. Yeah, she went to yeah, us and made like £7 billion. Pounds. Yeah. yeah she did but, quite no, 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 but just she was so beautiful, wasn't she? She completely changed the uh, football face of Burberry. Yeah. Um, Great. Right, Chris, ju Chris, just oh, to sorry, quick, just. Gone. Just to close that off, if we were all to go and buy a super saloon today to drive mm. every day, oh, what no, would it you, be? I've, got, I've got to stop you one second. A super oh. saloon is an M5 or That's an fine. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This sorry. is a, this uh, is a luxury exact, saloon. A luxury saloon. I'm being a pedant, I'm sorry. What would it be? Uh, S-Class. I mean, I, I, you know, professionally, I've spent a lot of time in the back of the current S-Class going to work, and it is just a magnificent vehicle. That All that, I actually... I look at all the haptic crap that's going on for the guy that drives it, and I feel sorry for him. Yeah. But at the back, with my footrest and everything next to me, I, it's, it's brilliant. It's a brilliant, brilliant car. Do they have to put an extra footrest in there for you so it actually becomes something you could rest your feet on? I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I just put my legs out straight. The footrest, I didn't even reach the seat in front. It's okay. fine. Yeah. Okay. Good guy. Good there. to know. Good guy there. Uh, right. Um, let's, <laughs> let's move on. To... My Ferrari 456 would be just perfect. The it would. I could sit in the back of one. There's no problem. Well, no, you notice, yeah. by the way, that you notice, by the way, that less than three minutes after Chris Cooper opened a bottle of a bottle of something alcoholic on the podcast, he starts shit talking me. <laughs> He's a cheap date. He, yeah. Oh my god, he really <laughs> is. He really is. I need be too. Otherwise, I'll lose control. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm a bit lightweight. Um, is that it, a clean chaser? I think that was, wasn't it? Are you chasing white wine with a pint? No, I've got, oh. I've got two of those. Oh, sorry. You put two in a glass. Yeah, because they're quite small and it's a big glass. That's that's you're a logical man. That's illogical. If you leave it in the bottle, it stays cold. So no, I had well, I, I mostly drank the first bottle. The other bottle was in the freezer because I had to take them out of the so gas. You were already moment. swinging when you walked into the room. <laughs> no, I thought about doing that, but I am now. Can you can you do this with your glasses? Yeah, I nearly did that earlier. I nearly did it earlier, but I missed. <laughs> oh, was that intentional? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, here we go. This is a this is a this is a one that's this is really good. Um, Piston heads forum uh, fodder, I think, back in the day. Um, how do we feel Porsche handles the allocation of its special cars? Um, you can lob bombs now, everyone, because no one seems to agree on this. Um, Neil Clifford, tell us what you think. Lads, sit down, get ready for a story. <coughs> Not that it matters. No, I think Edward <laughs> will be able to be much more well-informed on yeah. the strategy of allocation of these wonderful vehicles. But I'm, I'm, I'm capable of talking about why they do them and the importance of them, because... All brands and brand strategies, you need scarcity. If you are going to be a cool brand, you need scarcity. You need the resellers to be in your brand. You need to be able to command premiums over list in order that there is a hype to whatever your brand and whatever you're selling. So the cleverness of this, and frankly, we can all refer to it in sneakers, certainly in my, in my industry. You can refer to it in watches. You know, you only have to look at Rolex, Patek, or AP, yeah. probably the only brands that are getting resale over list on watches. Jewelry, go and look at StockX, which is the most incredible website, where if you want to Sakai, Nike, and, you know, your 12-year-old son has queued up outside of Offspring for 14 hours to get a pair. He then whacks them onto StockX and makes 300 quid or 400 quid or 500 quid. So I think the importance of having scarcity and hype and over-trading of your product is a very, very important element of 
brand strategy. So I think Porsche have done a brilliant job of doing that. Clearly, whatever, I don't know, it's 1963 this time, isn't it? Because there's the 60 years of Porsche. They could sell 10,000, but frankly, they couldn't sell 10,000 because if they if they made 10,000, there wouldn't be the scarcity to it. So I think that um, is a very clever thing to do. Um, that's a very that's good an, answer, Neil. That's an, Ed, that's Ed, an excellent essay. Ed, Ed yeah, would love it. On. Ed would love it. You know a bit about this. Okay, well, there's a few things I need to say, and I'll have to circle back to them. The first thing is, I don't really care as long as I get one. That's the first and most important thing. <laughs> and that, and that's, that's the truth that no one ever utters on these forums, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's, that's all that really matters. And by the way, I very rarely get one. So I spend about three and a half seconds being pissed off. And then I actually realise I actually don't need the fucking car in the first place anyway. So if they don't want to give it to me, so what? I'll move on. I can buy one at a later date in my life. Um, I think different manufacturers deal with it in different ways. And I think Ferrari probably deal with it better than anyone now because they, they really, they let the sellers or the buyers know how they're handling them. So you have to buy X, Y, and Z yeah to get true. to to get these future models and 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 if you don't own this we're probably not going to be able to alley, allocate that so it is a game i think P porsche have given up managing it themselves now i think they probably would disapprove of dealers doing underhanded things and giving them always to the same person where it ends up with a with a spe on a speculator's website or a, a dealer's website However, I think in general, they do a very good job. You know, I'm pretty close to this. There are brown bags going around left, right and centre, I can tell you. I and with I'm some, shocked. And with some of the bigger dealer groups, I, I, I think even the businesses don't really care. You know, if that's what makes it all work, that's what makes it work. But, you know, as Neil they're said, you know... They're delivering Indian takeaways to dealer principals. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. In, in Exactly that, yeah. Other other national takeaways are available. Yeah. I, 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 one thing I did find funny is that um, the, the CEO of Rolls-Royce announced recently that they're going to blacklist anyone who speculates on the new Rolls-Royce Spectre. Is that um, Talk Sensing Diff? Whatever yeah, his name they're, is. correct. They're going to be blacklisted. Well, that's, bullshit. that's that, that's great, but I'm sure they'd unblacklist them if they want to spend five hundred grand on a Phantom Two, yeah, yeah. Or, or the Phantom Seven, whatever the latest Phantom is. And you know, and Range, um, you know, we're talking about GT threes limited to nineteen hundred and sixty um, three cars, etc. But Range Rover are blacklisting people all over the country. You flip a Range Rover. And, you know, they are not going to deal with you again. You, you sell a car for export, or you buy a car and sell it for export as a private individual. They are never going to sell you a car again. Well, who's going to buy the Evoke convertibles and the Jaguar I-Paces and all this stuff that sits in the dealer yeah. showrooms that no one wants? So it's, I think some of them deal with it in a quite short-sighted manner. But, you know, Neil as a retailer knows this game in, inside out. And, and it's all about supply and demand. and that that magic just brings so much brand appeal. I think some of it has has occurred by accident because if, if you think back to nine nine seven Gen two RS, there were unsold cars sitting around in dealers. Not very many, but there were some. I can remember being offered that I had a nine nine seven Gen one, which was a cancelled order and was sat in the dealership. I can remember being offered by Porsche Centre Reading, for whom I bought the enormous volume of one vehicle in, in the previous history, they offered me a 996 RS because they weren't sure that people would buy it. Yeah. So it's, it's not been forever that Porsche has had this. And clearly there was a period after the GFC, um, global financial crash, um, that GFC, everybody calls it GFC? No. Call it whatever you want. The the thing we've in got one of those around, we've got one of those around the corner. GFC. I normally have chicken and a bun and gravy. Um, <laughs> that that um, money became cheaper, and lots of markets the the these things became asset classes. And now that 
interest rates are sort of returning and have returned to somewhere approximating normal. I mean, Range Rover having a problem because he can't make enough of this stuff because they've had so many problems in deciding how to make them and, and they've probably not managed their supply chain very well because they're a very small company. But at some point, their supply chain will return to normal and people realize it's a Range Rover. They're not trying to restrict the supply of these things. They're not trying to create a Halo product. They might try to do that with some of the stuff, but I, I just don't think with a Range Rover, it's, it's, an, it's remotely easy thing to do. But Porsche had, and you know, Ferrari's always been that way. Watches are on, on here now. There's loads of things I see on TikTok of posh watch dealers talking about how you can deal with your Rolex AD authorized distributor, I presume, or dealer, I presume that means, but how you game the system of getting a Daytona or whatever. Um, question though is how does Porsche handle the allocation? My sense is having, and I've got very narrow experience, is that um, there's a little bit more transparency than perhaps there was in terms of takeaway delivery bags being stuffed with cash. Um, not least because it's very hard to deal with large sums of cash these days because, you know, what you do with it other than leaving it under bed, you can't put it into, you know, banks these days are making it harder and harder for you to turn up with anything more than a couple of hundred quid to do with, to get it into the bank. So how would you deal with it? You could do it via lottery, or you could say, as, as I think Porsche dealers do and Rolex ADs do and Ferrari dealers is, who's bought the most stuff from us? That feels elitist, um, and it feels destined to exclude genuine enthusiasts who have saved and saved and saved and decided this is the car for them. They may not be successful, and they'll end up paying overs at some point. Um, there are greater problems in the world and societies than that, I fear. So I'm not sure, given, because Neil's essay is spot on. It's a really, really good essay um, as to why it happens and why. Porsche um, need it. They need it. It's, it's not, they're not doing it to take the piss. It's doing it because it's fundamental to the value of the brand and survival of the business. I mean, and, there's only two brands that have it, right? Ferrari, Porsche, really. I mean, yeah. Lawrence Stroll would be, desperately sitting in his bed now in Mauritius or Mystica, wherever he is, thinking, how the fuck do we create demand and hype? Yeah, that well, that's a, that's, that's a, can I just yeah. step in there? That's a very good question, Neil. And, and, and Aston Martin don't, but they take a very different strategy. So Aston Martin price their cars with the speculation built in. Yeah. Porsche don't. And one of the reasons Porsche is so open to it is because the GT3 is 150,000 quid. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you want you want the latest baby Ferrari with a few options on it, it's 320,000 mm -hmm. quid. And, and and Porsche have just decided not to double the price of their exclusive products to make them super expensive. Ferrari yeah. or Aston Martin be like, I tell, you know, there's a few people that want a Zagato. Let's let's put a million quid. Well, well let's call it a million quid. That that'll make us some money. <laughs> yeah. But the STs no, quite okay. Sorry, man, go, yeah. go on. No, just I, I was talking to Neil when I first met him in in person about the, the I mean I can't answer this question in terms of Porsches, but I think I sort of can with Church's shoes because that's something I've been buying since I was I don't know my mid twenties, and um, it became a private equity business. I don't know when was it, Neil? Five six no, years it's, ago. It's, it's, it's owned by Prada. Prada, well, Prada bought it, and so the, a really good pair of Church's when I was. Um, a very junior doctor was about 125 pounds and that escalated and it hit 320, 350, something like that. Now they're 700. They double literally overnight because they said, yeah, they just sat down, they did their sums and went, you know what we're going to do? It's exactly as Edward has said, we're just going to price this thing such that we don't care about the 30% of customers that we lose who just about buy a pair of shoes every whatever. We'll, um, we'll go after the people who can afford 700 pounds and that will more than make up um, you know, the, the difference, because 700 pounds, you know, for a pair of brogues, you know, call, call me old fashioned. That's, I think that's, that's a crazy sum of money. And it sounds like the 350,000 pounds. Sorry? You're old fashioned. I know I'm old fashioned. But I've been buying them since I was 25. So 30 years. And to see this go like that, literally, I mean, that just tells you something about the world. And I think you're right, Edward, that you've got a car that costs 150,000 pounds. You've got a car that costs 320,000 pounds. You know, some would argue the 150,000 pound car is the better car. 
But, I think um, Porsche are getting better at it though. The ST is two thirty. Yeah, it's a lot more. Yeah. But it's not, it's, it's not, 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 it's not in my trick. trick. It's got quite trick stuff on it. You know, they've not, you know, having spoken to them, they've got, it's got, you know, shorter gear ratios. It's got stuff on it that's bloody expensive. Oh, yeah, shorter gear ratios. They're amazingly expensive. Aren't yeah, they? But, if you've got, if, but if you've got to tool it, you've got to homologate it. What was, <laughs> that, that is bloody R? expensive. What was the 911 yeah. R when that arrived? 145. Yeah. With some, okay. you could add quite a few bits onto that. Well, I, I, the, I, the thing I, is, what you what you have to do though is it's actually not two hundred and thirty grand. It's two hundred and thirty grand plus all the options, plus ten grand for the sales manager, plus twenty grand for the dealer principal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I wouldn't have wanted to have been a dealer principal this week though, because you've got every no. single one of your customers ringing up, driving you mad. Yeah. And what can you do? You're going to get one. A, you're going to get one car. You're going to get two cars. One's got Ed's name on it, so it's not. There's not much yeah. work there, is there? There's. I think it's a really interesting situation because if I if I imagine that I'm a more of a casual observer of the car of the motor industry, like a casual enthusiast. Um, Sorry. So what did you say? Shut up. <laughs> I can. Um, I can imagine. You, you know, you'd pick up Evo. You'd see Evo in a in a hospital waiting room or something, and then you might look at. I'm a sorry to hear you've been in trouble. And you'd see you'd see the magazine. You see, there's this new GT3. It's won all the tests, and then you'd you know you might have a windfall and make a few quid, and you'd walk into Porsche and say, "Can I buy a GT3, please?" And they just laugh at you. It's really weird because I, I would be thinking if it was the if I had just seen a new Leica camera and I walked into a Leica camera shop and said, I've got a few quid. I really want that camera. Can I buy one? And they went, yeah, you're having a laugh, aren't you? I'd probably say, well, why, do you, why do you promote the uh, fucking thing? They've got some of that. I'm, 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 so, I'm sorry, you're wrong. I've been trying to buy a Leica Q3 for the last eight weeks and they are putting a lottery. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not yeah. wrong. I'm, I'm just using this yeah. example. I, as, if you go to... Chris is never wrong, Ed. No, but I'm, I'm, I've not said anything's right or wrong. I'm trying, I'm trying to just say it's, it must be really weird for people that think that these things are available, that you can just, yeah. it's something you can go and buy. It's not. Yeah. It's, there's a, it, 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 there's, there's a meme there's going around on here. here. You can't, yeah, you meme, can't just go and buy one. There's a meme going around on here of some of some clip of a picture of Hammond and Clarkson from one of their grand tour things yeah, with that, yeah. various scenarios of, you know, Porsche salesman when a customer yeah, comes yeah, and yeah. says, can I have an ST? It's Rolex so dealers when, you know, or and Leica, shop staff when customer comes in and asks for the yeah it's yeah it's and that all that says yeah it's working it's deliberate yeah. brand yeah strategy i, I think yeah, it's yeah. working i mean they're, they're, it was interesting talking to some of the people at porsche who work on those cars there there have been some instances where it wasn't just latterly them trying to build one one too few cars to keep people hungry there's one one side of it that i didn't understand enough was that when you use quite trick bits on cars you have to use, you know, a supplier that you wouldn't normally use for that. And it's, some of the problems they've had over the years is just uh, just tooling and parts and stuff for mm -hmm. the cars. You know, if you go to make a special carbon bonnet and it's a bloke down the road in in the Black Forest that makes the carbon bonnet, he can only do you 2,000. That's it. He's done. He's moving on yep. to the next product after that. So they're limited like that. As for all the whinging, I totally agree with Edward. It's 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 absolute rubbish until you get one. And then when you get one, you're over the moon. So that's... Yep. It's it's a it's almost a sort of microcosm of human behaviour in one spot, isn't it? You see, totally. You see the the ones that get them walk out looking like the cat got the cream. The ones that don't get them find any public forum possible to whinge about the fact they've not got one. Um, and then and everyone else sits around thinking, is this the ultimate example of a first world problem? How can you genuinely publicly yes. tell us you're pissed off because you didn't get an allocation for a posh beetle? Um, but but I the do. Work, the work, I think. I do oh, think the world and Cambridge, darling. It's the uh, same thing. Yeah, it, this it's never going to affect the GT cars at Porsche, but the world is changing. You know, the, the, as uh, Chris said, with interest rates and you know, waiting lists and you know, people ordering nine eleven GTSs and turbos because they yeah. may just flip one for twenty grand profit. You know, That's those gone. days are over. There, it gone. is over. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's interesting, and maybe it'll get back that way. But you know, nine six four RS in the UK was a you know the dealer now. Is, is just fending off fit his 50 or her 50 best clients saying, I'm sorry, I love you, but you can't have one. Whereas in 1990, they were thinking, oh, don't allocate me one of those fucking RSs. It just, you know, and don't give me it in that bloody ruby stone colour. I'll be looking at that in the showroom for six months. Yeah. That's just amazing how things have changed. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, moving on. Good discussion.
Um, uh, oh, this is oh. Like, this is like <laughs> oh. And just to be clear, I, I, you, you can't accuse me of being right or wrong about this, Edward. This is this is just it's just an answer. I could do what's, whatever I want. What's your? We're aware of that. What's your favourite <laughs> glove box? Come on, what a great! I love a glove box. First of all, first of all, put your hands up if you love a glove box. Oh, now we're going to go straight to the sour puss who's drinking his beery weary. <laughs> what? Why don't you like glove boxes? What have you got against them? What did one do to you? Did one interfere with you as a child? <laughs> I actually do have a favourite glove box. <laughs> I actually have two. Um, seems to be being so snarky. The first one was when Top Gear was good. Ooh. And it was the it was a glove box in the Skoda Yeti when Sienna Miller was in it. That was a fucking good blood. Sky I don't know. Love box. Called. You were gonna call it a love box. You were <laughs> Sienna Miller's got a love box. I have another favorite glove box. It's a Jackamex GP concept. <laughs> Who knows what a Jackamex GP concept is? Googling is? it now. No. Uh, it's a nuclear fuels handling glove box. That's what they're called. They're actually called, you know, those things where you see in James Bond films where they, they've got their hands in this big glass. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. They're actually, the technical name for them is glove boxes. And he, a few years ago, a few years ago now, when I was a pup consultant, I, when I was at uh, Tush Ross and Lloyd's, we worked with British Nuclear Fuels, both at Sellafield, which is the spookiest place in the world, and also Risley, where the headquarters of what was then BNFL is now. It's now a runoff business because they've Spend the next million years running his business down. Um, and I got to play with a glove box. So I was at Sellafield and some, and we were talking about uh, details are important, but somebody said, Would you like to play with my glove box? That's not the kind of offer you get every day. So I went into this sort of thing, all the kind of the hazy mat things on and so forth, and said, so You can put your hands in here, you can do stuff, you can like sort of hey, the best bit is trying to clap two bits of uranium, whatever it is together, see if it goes <laughs> boom. I presume that was nuclear engineer's sense of humour. It won't go boom. Don't worry, everybody. I wasn't about to incinerate the planet. So actual glove boxes, I presume this question is about glove boxes in cars. I'm torn on this. Not the way that Neil was completely one-sided on cup holders, because you could only see that cup holders were used for coffee, when tea is an acceptable beverage to put in a cup holder. I'll move on. I'm, I'm, I'm over that. Glove boxes were clearly invented as receptacles or vessels into which one would put one's driving gloves. Hands up, who's got a pair of driving gloves and is prepared to admit it? Oh, for God's sake. You want present, me? present, never worn, never worn. No, the I problem I've got with, with many glove boxes is they're not fit for purpose. They can't do much with them. So if, you, if we were to invent the car from scratch, would we have some sort of rather flimsy, because they're all quite flimsy these days, even Range Rovers are all quite flimsy, and they're not very evenly shaped, so you can't get much in them. Lots of cars, you can't even get the, there's, been a, there's, a, there's a graph in here. The graph is, what's happened to the size of glove boxes? What's happened to the size of the documents? It's gone that way. So the documents don't go in the glove box anymore. My, I've got an Alpine A110. Very cleverly, they've said there's no point having a glove box. It's pointless. It just gets in the way. It's a piece of equipment. It's some it's some bits of stuff which add weight to the car. We'll have a little packet thing. Ever goes in. I have a Velcro bit on the back. So you put it behind the passenger seat, and it Velcros itself to the firewall of the car. So there's no glove box. Adds to the lightness and so forth. How so, strong is the, how strong is that beer you're drinking? <laughs> This is a really long answer. It's quite low, it's quite low strength. Um, it's really, if wrong, I it's was a really to choose, long non-answer. Um, Discovery 4 had a good glove box. It yes, did. it did. Yep. It did, yep. Yeah. Very good glove box. Um, the problem is, it, so if you're, if you're a proper farmer, then you'll have stuff that rattles. You'll put a, a bit of a broken tractor or a, a big spanner or something, and it just rattles around. So... Um, I, I still search for the perfect glove box because the perfect glove box would have space to put useful things in it, like a big spanner, but it wouldn't rattle around because somebody decontented it because you couldn't see it. So the plastic was a bit scratchy and there's no padding inside. But if I had to choose one that wasn't a Jack and Mex GP concept, which is my favorite, Sienna Miller probably no longer being available on the Skoda configurator site, 
as a glove box extra, I would probably go for a Discovery 4 glove box. That's a good glove box. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anybody what time's your flight, Edward? <laughs> Uh, j just uh, just before just before the track day chat. <laughs> I'm I'm I was pretending, pretending I'm frozen actually, but I just yeah no I was very good. You have me. I just thought yeah, you had it's, me. Like, it's ironic that the Edinburgh Fringe is on now because that that easily could be a performance from the Fringe that we just heard there. Wonderful little monologue from Mister. I'm on my way there now. Um, so uh, Manish, what's your favourite glove box? Um, <clears throat> Hmm. I, I actually have three that I thought were really rather wonderful. Well, oh, this is Mr. 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 Cooper. This is catching now. This is a disease. No one will give me one answer anymore. <laughs> well, we, 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 answer. we took my we took my um, my dad and I took my um, stepmother's BMW five three five in for a service. I remember. I there was a we we had um, thirty minutes to kill. Right? It was the first time I'd seen. Trying to remember the year, it was something like 88, 89. It was a BMW 750 IL. Do you remember that? Yeah. Oh, well, yes. Yes. And, um, with the wide, with the wide wider kidneys. kidneys, wider kidneys. Yes. The B12 wider kidneys. kidneys. No, I, I still think it, the proportions of that car are so beautiful. Yeah. Look at that car, every angle. So um, the dealers have said to me, um, Do you want to take it for a ride? And I said, Yes. So I got into this car with him. And it, do you remember it had a fly-by-wire throttle as well? Yeah. And this was just the most amusing. And the upholstery was just unbelievable. It was such a beautiful car. My dad was actually flipping. Was, was he going to go BMW for his next one? He was going to stay with his S-Class Mercedes. He, he did the latter. But um, I sat in this car. And um, he, this, this guy was just showing me around. It was the first time I'd ever seen a glove box that came out as a tray. Remember the Mark Newson car? I was saying that the boot was a tray. It was a drawer. Yeah. This thing was a drawer. It was just, it was so clever. It just went like, it just literally slid out rather than having a silly flappy lid. And it had the, it was the most complicated shape. And I remember the, as if it was just, it was a sort of pyramid of um, rectangles that kind of vanished into nothing. And it, it just, it was really satisfying clunk when it closed. And he said, look to your left and just to my left. Just on the armrest on the door, there was a little concealed, I mean, a little compartment. You flipped it up and it had three little, almost if you have three perfect watches, you could put one watch into each of these. Like the, 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 the best glove box ever for me, BMW 750. Yeah. yeah. Late yeah. I, need to, I need to, I've never seen one of those. I need to see that gear, that, that glove box. Uh, Neil Clifford, glove box. I think I think we're right up the right alley here. I think that glove boxes have to do three things. They have to all hold the documents. Yeah. They have to hold the service history pack. Yeah. They have to hold a duster or some sort of contraption to clean the windscreen on the inside. Yes, because it gets a bit foggy and it's a bit foggy. And do you, you know why it does? You know what does that? It's, um, I used to go out with somebody whose flatmate was in the petrochemical industry, and it's the emissions, it's kind of, some, I may have got this completely wrong, people in the comments will tell us this, but it's something to do with how the sun reacting with the plastic of a dashboard to send stuff, and yep. it sort of creates this sort of horrible, foggy stuff inside. And you see, so you need you need a nice little rag, so you need one of those. A decent rag, and you don't want to leave that visible because it's fucking ugly. So you need yes, to put exactly. it in the glove box, and then you need a place for mints. And these mints need to be emergency mints because if they're visible, you just eat the fuckers really yeah. quickly. So you need emergency mints that you slightly forget, out of reach. Yes, that you forget that are there until you get in a very difficult situation. Yeah. I'm like, revising my opinion of glove boxes as you're selling this to me. You've broken yeah. down or there's a drama and you yeah. need, fuck, I'm hungry, I've got no food. Oh, my God, the emergency mints are in the glove box. Yeah. And I think the last thing I'd say is because it's BMW for me, is that torch. Yes! You cannot mm. fucking forget the torch, the little white torch that was always plugged in, it was always charged, and I always, I never owned, as, as, as uh, Chris is right, you never, in the 80s, you could never get one of those BMWs because they were your dad's car or your boss's car. You always had the shit Ford. That's but two weeks on the trot. Oh. You've chosen what I was going to say. I mean, it's just unfair, Neil Clifford. I'm speaking before you from now on. Yeah, okay. So mint, torch, little duster thing and service history. Very important for a glove yeah. box. Yeah. 
I um and a fridge. And a fridge. My Audi A4 Avant has a fridge big yeah. enough for two bottles of children's milk. That yeah, is why air, air conditioned. That's quite good. I, I, now. I think the first car to have an air conditioned glove box was actually a Saab, but I'd have to, I, from my memory, my geek memory. Edward Lovett, I know you think deeply on this subject about glove boxes. What are your thoughts? Well, I'm, I knew the torch was going to come up, but uh, I'm not sure if I've discussed this before, but I've had a few car accidents in my life. Yeah. And uh, one of them was in a twisty little lane um, after playing squash with a friend of mine. I, I was prattling around doing something and I decided to take to the curb at 60 miles an hour when actually this ditch at 60 miles an hour in a BMW, unlike most accidents I've had where you can't drive away from them, this one, I could, but I did have to put a spare wheel on the back. So <laughs> my friend stood there with the tiny little torch at about 11 o'clock at night holding it whilst I was trying to take the, take the wheels off. So I have a, I have a good story about the torch. Um, BMW i3, I quite like an upper glove box. Because yeah, sometimes, two glove boxes. You know, if, yeah. if you've got a full glove box, stuff can come out of it. So that's not a very good thing. Mm -hmm. um, storage and sort of the stories we have growing up. Like, I'm sure, you know, as a child being in a glove, in a passenger seat, being allowed to sit up the front, playing with the torch or whatever mints or, or, mm -hmm. or sweet, sweeties might be in the, in the glove box is quite a nice thing. And obviously for Americans, there's probably a gun in the glove box, so you can play with that if you want, oh, yes. well, so whilst that's... your parents are driving. Um, and then finally, a car without a glove box. I, doesn't, I, I feel like I need some st storage. And there's one particular car that really confuses me, which is a 458 Speciale, because it's got this funny little pad in, yes. in where where the glove box should be i'm not quite sure what that pad does because i'm pretty sure it's nothing it's there's padded plenty, there's plenty of space there for a glove box it would be a better it, it would it would be a million pound car if I had a glove box so what's your favorite <laughs> glove box uh bmw i3 okay good answer um but it doesn't but it doesn't have a toy it, 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 so it doesn't have that a, pad. sorry say that again the padding is that that's not some form of safety um, device. It's only, I just say because a story just came to mind in the 50s, the um, American College of Orthopedic Surgeons were very, 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 very pissed off with the way that glove boxes and those metal cars hinge from the bottom. So when people had accidents, the glove yeah. box would open and it would amputate you below the knees Ooh, yeah. of the passenger. And they lobbied no the that. industry for a long time to just quite simply move the hinge to the top. And that problem doesn't exist. I agree. I think um, yeah, I've been looking at I'm a BMW glove box, obviously, from my uh, everyone's had too much to drink. We're recording on a Sunday. It's stupid because it's not a school night. We're behaving poorly. It's like Mufti Day at school. So um, BMW glove box, I think, I think glove boxes, Edward's right, they refer back to our youth slightly. This idea that um, you remember sitting in the passenger seat and you could play with stuff. And I, my father's glove box was always the same in every car. A, a tin of barley sugars, his Avon uh, Road Atlas from 1974, uh, yeah. and, and, um, and his sunglasses, which were from Boots. Yeah, sun, Road Atlas. We talked about maps last week. The thing that I was thinking about last week, in fact, two things from last week, I meant to say, I know we're not talking about Formula One this week, but under heading in motorsport, we did miss last week. Jake Dennis last weekend became Britain's first Formula E world champion. Part what we think about Formula E, that's a bloody big event. So Jake yeah. Dennis, well done. Um, and and it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a direction change from glove boxes, but congratulations. Jim. We'll talk, yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about maps go in the back maps. of seats. They do not go in glove boxes. Well, I can remember my father having a problem with this because actually an E21 3 Series had a massive, BMWs have massive glove boxes yeah. and you could get your map book in there. And I remember him having a bit of a shit fit when I think he bought an E30 and he couldn't get the ma his map book. Fit. Yeah, it wasn't a map, it was always a map book. He well, you mapping. say that. Was it in fact a gazetteer? I don't know. No, it was it was, a, it was know, a hardback book. I could have been a gazetteer. The one. Does, does anyone know what a gazetteer is as opposed no. to a map? Is it a, is it anything to do with glove boxes? It could be, yeah. A gazetteer is a document that describes the places you'll find on the map. 
I'm here to help. Yeah, Thank I, you. I need to I need to think about that. Um, so that's that. I think BMW. There's something about being a glove box. Is the way that, yeah. that that latch, that catch would pull forwards, and then yeah. and the noise they make when they shut, and of course the torch. But I was just thinking of people, you know, stuff that people like to Google if they're listening to this. The Alpha Ninety um, uh, glove box. Do you remember that? This was the most no, brilliantly no baffling piece of uh, a mid '80s Italian design when they when they were just trying to do anything different because they felt they had to, because they knew they couldn't compete on, on a level playing field with the Germans. Mm. The Alpha 90 had a built-in briefcase in the dashboard. So you could you could basically get in and you'd slot your briefcase <laughs> into the dashboard. And that's, that's where the glove box was. <laughs> if, you, if you Google it, it's absolutely, it's absolutely crap plastic. For the businessman who has yeah. nothing. It, it's, <laughs> a, it's a briefcase that goes into the dashboard. And um, <laughs> it was just, try, go and Google it, the Alpha 90. So there we go. We've um, we've We've got through... Uh, glove boxes just um now i'm offering each of you the chance to bring back one car from the from the dead it can be a road or a race car and it has to come back absolutely as it was built in period when it was a current production car so what car do you miss most what would you like to come back and be built manish and can be a road car or racing car and and one just one car just one, no, no, just one car i i really thought about this i thought you've you've got to got to got to get something that you don't see on the streets or on a track every day. I was thinking, you know, what is really unique? And it's got to be something that you'd not do anything to. So, you know, all of those resto mods that we were talking about, yeah, yeah. or the fact that, you know, um, Harry and Meghan drove off in an electric E-type. That's just wrong for don't two reasons. Don't get me started. Yeah, well, exactly. And I was thinking, what, what was a car? Now, I think this is... This, I guess this could be a fancy car, but I think it's got to be a car from your youth that you thought was perfect and that you just don't see and you don't know anyone who has one. And there was just one car that I thought of. I thought, my gosh, I don't think I, I've seen one on the road in years and years and years. I did have a go in one once. I think I was eight or nine years old. And I do think in its own quirky way, it was absolutely perfect. And it would be a Jensen Interceptor. Oh. Oh. I, I would just love a beautiful, massive engined, leather upholstered, dark metallic with red leather Jensen Interceptor, seven and whatever lease from that. But I just think it's such a beautiful car. And I think, uh, you know, I don't think, has anyone made anything like that since? Is there, there is, there, there's a um, there, There's a company near Richard Tuttle's called Cropperty Bridge. That, yeah. uh, re that resto mod yeah. interceptors. Yeah. We're, we're, Chris, we're not resto modding here. We're, 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 we're no, 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 I'm, just, I'm, just, yeah. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. Yeah, I, I just don't think there's a, I think that the, the question really said, for me anyway, what it was really saying was, is there a car out there that we just do not build and we don't build anything that approximates? That, that, it's exactly that, Manish. Edward, what's your car that, that, isn't, that isn't being built that, that, or was built in the past that you'd like to come back? Fine. I'm going to be it. I'm going to be very well behaved because I have three cars written down here. Oh. Um, but but just so I don't lead Chris down an acceptable, I've only got one. Path. No, fine. So That's I, I, I I base this on a car that that I'd still like to drive today as a relatively modern car that I didn't have an opportunity to buy new. And I think on reflection, with some, even some cars that we did buy new, we might regret not going to town on the specification of that car like oh i went with red with black leather but i could have had this or that and i could have done something cool with the stitching or i could have gone to mm -hmm. um, the factory and done an atelier spec so i am going to say two now but i'm going to be i'm going to end with one but i'll get over and done with quickly so 991 gt2 rs is probably a car which i wish i had an opportunity to have bought new and spec it my my myself but um, that's too obvious. So I'm going to go with a 599 GTO. Mm. Um, I think it's a brilliant F car and it's got the right look, the right noise. It's got the right balance of analog handling and power where, you know, the, the, T, the TDF Neil, brilliant car, but fuck me. I, I think it's almost too powerful, that car. Um, and it, it dances around on the road like a lunatic asylum. But um, that's a terrible analogy. Anyway, 599 GTO, Atelier spec at the factory. What colour would you do it? 
That's a very good question. I haven't written that down, but um, uh, inside would be a combination of Coyo and Chocolato or something yeah. like that. And I, yeah. I, I'm not I'm not sure. Outside, blue, pot green, soup, pot something soup, like pot that. Soup, pot soup. Pot soup. Yeah. It's pot, pot soup. soup. Pot soup. Pot soup. Yeah. Um, uh, Chris Cooper, uh, which seven cars are you going to choose? No, I, I've only got one. Okay. I've got one road car and one road race car. That's one. But there's actually only one. Uh, and actually, manage. I'm amazed you didn't choose a 456M manual. Because oh, otherwise, just... when are you ever going to buy one? I look point. every day, 15 on this and heads today, still the same 15. Okay, all right. We live in hope. We, we won't let I this go. December 2022, Fosco's had one. I missed so, it. There are two. And... Um, the road car, this is not my choice, but the road car would be an SLS, Mercedes SLS. I mm. just think that's no. a really, really, really nice thing. Be nice for everyone. Um, but it's a race car. Um, and it's, it's partly influenced by um, seeing uh, a friend of the family, uh, Chris Wilson, who is running his at Goodwood at the Festival of Speed, Porsche 962. Yeah. I would love it. If yeah, Porsche awesome. started building 962s, <laughs> and you could you could go and take your trailer there, and they give you literally give you the keys like you would in a road car, yeah. and you stick it in your trailer, and you take it home, and you could do loads of stuff with it. So yeah, if I could bring one car back from the dead, it would be a race car. It would be a Porsche 962. Well, good it. choice. Good choice. Well, yeah. That's a very really good question. So uh, I quite like the Repsol one that our chum Chris has. Um, hard to walk past Rothmans, but there were so yeah. many because that was that era where Absolutely. the new man one, I quite like the new man one. Skull Bandits one, I quite like that. And oh, I quite like the Richard yeah, Lloyd yeah. special one that Jonathan Palmer drove, the Cannon one. That was Cannon. Cannon. Cannon's my Cannon one. Yeah. Fabulous. Um, Cannon. Neil Clifford, what, this is the kind of thing you could, you could take over your brain space for about three weeks this could, couldn't it? Oh, so it did. It be? Yeah. Well, actually it did, but it's a very, very simple answer. I'm referring this week's, this week's book of dyslexics is the Ferrari Encyclopedia by LJK Set Right. And, you know, ben, Ferrari... Ben you can, yeah. Forward by John Surtees. Look at that. Oh. Wow. Um, Ferraris used to make really ugly cars. <laughs> okay. Which yeah. No, on. no, no one thinks are pretty. So it's obvious, uh, undoubtedly obvious, without question, undisputably obvious. With 275 no, GTB. No program. it's and buts, and plainly obvious to everyone with any taste whatsoever that it is the 275 Ferrari. And you imagine. It's a bit well, cross-eyed, that. No. It's got the little bumperette, that one. Look at that. It's got the extended bumper. And you imagine Ferrari. <laughs> yes, oh, yes, it's exactly like that. <laughs> Get away! <laughs> God. And I, I thought deeply on this because, you know, it would be 60 years of the um, 275 GTB in um, 2025. And you imagine them bringing out 60 short nose because that's how the car was designed you don't want that ugly fucking long nose one you no. want the short nose you want six carbs yep and ferrari bring out 60 of them limited edition i mean they'd be five million quid each exactly built yeah as ferrari started to plunder its back catalog the way jaguar did and the oh way Martin did they would they would make billions billions it would be a separate business yeah it yeah. wouldn't be a 50 billion um, valued company, but a 100 billion company. You know, imagine yeah. if they made 60 275s. Yeah. Exactly. Imagine if you could go onto their configurator and just press F40. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. We had in the factory we never told you about. Yeah, it was really bad, actually, as it turns out. Yeah. Um, okay, so I can't argue with that. 275 with a short smozzer and six carbs and yeah. Mr. Kipwood's happy. I thought about this in because uh, I think this is one of my questions. And I, thought, I thought about it in several ways. Um, so I've got four answers here. Um, Excellent. Because so I'm normally a bit, uh, a bit more succinct than the learned colleague Cooper. So first of all, I thought maybe the Renault Espace, because I think it's one of the greatest pieces of car design ever. <laughs> Sorry, for a minute there, I thought you said Renault Espace. Yes. And then it, but, and <laughs> okay, then also, it would, it, because the Espace died, and, and, and that concept of the MPV, the multi-purpose vehicle, died. That mm. led to, to the to the increase in sales of SUVs. So I thought if you bought this this fast pack, everyone might suddenly become more cultured yeah. with all these fucking tanks yeah. on the road. And that's that. fanciful, so that's not going to happen. Then I wrote down E39 M5. I wrote down 205 GTI, Mark II, 16 valve, mm. Golf, 16 valve. Then I thought W124 500E. Then I thought, what what do I actually want from this? What what I'm looking for is 
I'm not wistfully just looking for a car that I miss. I'm looking for a car that maybe had a place in a company's history that I know will never be repeated. I'm looking for a product that actually isn't built anymore. That type of car still exists, but there isn't one that does it quite the way I used to like it. And I think that, that you'll think this is mad. There was a car that was really popular when I started doing this job, um, that this company doesn't make a product like this and no one does. There isn't a car quite like it. And it's the 308 series Jaguar XJR, which is, I still think a great looking car, the 99, 98 car. Um, it wasn't that sporty, but it was bloody quick. It was subtle. It was British. It was just a great car. In, in any conventional hmm. group test, the Mercedes would shit on it and the BMW would be better to drive. But actually, no one makes a car like that anymore. That's it's true. Just, it's just a great... Yeah. And if someone, if Jaguar could make an XJR now, I think they'd be in quite a different place. Yes. I think, I think, That's a I very think good point. people would go and buy them. Yeah. Was that 4 litre or the 4.2? I think I think I've heard it in, in hindsight that the six cylinder car was a better engine, but the V8 sounded you want better. The V8. You want the yeah, V8. the V8 is, but they, they tend to break a bit more. But no, they're great. You know, just the idea of that little rear packet, rear seat package, and the, the big flat boot deck lead when you open yeah. it up and you had the big coffin head of you. I just they were great to drive. Yes, lovely cars. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now moving on, we are. Um, we're doing our two car garage, which this week is a long one because <laughs> Mr. Clifford, Mr. Clifford really indulged himself, and we like it when he does that because they're rather good. Here we go. Um, uh, before you settle down, uh, to get the house, dog, mortgage, and have kids, you and your long term girlfriend, Penny, she comes back into this later, has decided to coordinate. Your employer's offer of a three-month paid sabbatical and travel across Europe and North America. Your plan is to tour Europe for eight weeks in high summer, buying a car in the UK and ending in Rome, where you have to sell the car, maybe even making a few bob. You then fly to Chicago and rent a car from any of the US car rental websites and drive the full length of Route 66 to Los Angeles, taking one month. Are you still there, guys? We're still going. Um, your total budget is £50,000 for the whole trip. Very generous, including fuel. Be aware that although Penny is excited, she can't... Oh, God. She can't drive and does get easily car sick if the car is very loud or has stiff suspension. Therefore, try to avoid her being sick as this will negatively impact the budget. You need to save enough money... You need to have enough money left to buy your flights home from LA, few. Ooh. It's a hell of a. Uh, Chris Cooper would have assessed this in in atomic detail. So let's go with him. So many questions. <laughs> so many questions. So. What the flight, Edward? What time is your flight? <laughs> so the first thing that caught my eye about this was the three month paid sabbatical. Now, if you're going to have a three, if both of you are going to have a three month paid sabbatical, you must have been working for your business for quite a long time and be reasonably senior so the first thing that said to me is that these two people were probably used to the nicer things in life rather than this being sort of a backpacking sort of budget kind of sort of sort of trip Chris the uh, uh, 50,000 pounds didn't give you the same hint well it's basically the budget so I, I'm gonna get to that I'm gonna get to that well spotted said the man in sunglasses um, eight weeks in high summer. So that's basically 56 days. 56 days traveling through Europe in high summer is going to be effing expensive. Um, and if you're going to buy a car in the UK and end in room where you might sell it again, probably has to be left-hand drive. I'm going to come back to that as well. And the budget for the whole trip, so the budget is basically a net figure. It's basically the net figure after you've done everything. So that actually gives you a bit more freedom. Um, I'm intrigued by Penny. I'm intrigued by Penny, particularly the fact that she gets car sick if the car is very loud. That's the cause of car sickness. I hadn't quite found it coming. Anyway, so I think what you do, you want to buy a left-hand drive car. So mm -hmm. if you wanted to buy a left-hand drive car... So we're, we're, better... we're, we're, we're four minutes in and he hasn't even started to answer the fucking question. I'm answering the question. This is all context. So... Uh, you'd buy a left-hand drive car. Where better to buy a left-hand drive car than on collecting cars? 
So I found on collection. Now I like the cut of your jib. You see, you know, just patience and faith. Other emotions are available, which you make more use of on a day-to-day -day basis, but patience and faith are available as well. So I went to the collecting cars, and you'd probably have to buy it in the Netherlands because you probably just get over the Channel Tunnel. You want to buy it in the Netherlands. So, and it's very tempting to say this is a Mercedes trip because it can't be too loud and it can't be too stiff of suspension. So I found in uh, Brabant, um, looking on what had been sold on collecting cars, it was a 560 SL available in South Brabant, so not far from the Channel Tunnel. Did you know that Brabant was where the wartime hero Guy Gibson met his end? He crashed his mosquito, actually North Brabant rather than South Brabant. Didn't, but uh, didn't Schoenberg. have... Anyway, so I would have got a 560 SL. I toyed with the idea there's a beautiful, beautiful green over Iroco 612. Oh, one of one. Oh, that's that's a good color grand. combo. Um, How are you I think that for both 50 grand? of those you could. Hmm? How are you getting that for 50 grand? You're not getting it for 50 grand. The budget for the whole trip is 50 grand. Yeah, it's you a net could, figure. You could, yeah, you could spy and sell it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but you can't but get exactly one. how I read the question, exactly as Chris did. You've got fifty thousand pounds to blow over twelve weeks. Yeah. You're yeah. gonna have to end up with a penny at the end of it. What Chris has said. What's the point of Neil going, going to all the trouble of writing stuff exactly, if we don't read it properly? Unless you read it properly. I mean, yeah. And Chris, Chris understands that is just a, the net figure is zero. You, 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 this is about spending. Yeah, but the first part of the question was: you have to buy a car with your budget and sell it. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't, it say, doesn't that. say that. Doesn't say that. That's why it's so clever. That's why it's Neil said to us when he when Neil sent this to us, he said, "Lots of traps." Hold on. Have you, Your have plan you finished yet, to, Chris? Let me just let me just. I, I'm I'm quite willing to admit I'm wrong. I normally am. Your plan is to tour Europe for eight weeks in high summer, buying a car in the UK and ending in Rome, where you have to sell the car. So maybe well, even making a few bob. Maybe even making a few bob. So what do you use to buy the car with? What do you you're, use? You're massive you earnings because you're boring. senior MPs. So exactly. the fifty, so the fifty grand is is exclusive of that. The fifty so grand is it's the end result. The so when you finish the trip, what did the trip cost you? So so the, actually, so actually, you can buy a car of any value. Exactly. Yeah. Well, if you if you end it well, you can. Should I carry on? Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> So I would have bought either the five sixty SL or the six twelve. Six twelve is beautiful, really, really lovely. So you'd have to think. So and on for the so on an the, unlimited budget, you've bought a five sixty SL, a Bobby. Well, Ewing. because because it's a bit weird that isn't it? because I, I I I took the liberty of saying that collecting cars would be a useful place to buy a left hand drive you did, car yep. if you were right. in the UK because it right. says buying a car in the UK. I'm in the UK. I went on to collecting cars and I bought a car while sitting in the UK. The car happened to be in the Netherlands, the closest part of Europe, which had interesting cars, to which I could access a car. I mean, Edward, this is free marketing. I mean, anyway, it's, it's amazing. I'm, waste, I'm, I'm wasted just, here. I'm just wondering what sort of trauma, head trauma you've, un, you, you suffered. Significant. To, to, to have an unlimited ago. budget and to buy a 560 SL. Because it's it can't be too stiff of suspension or noisy. Rate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Carry on. So, so you bought you've, so you bought the wrong car to go to Italy. And what are you going to so, do? With well, America? Merck's lovely. Have aircon that would work. Um, not too noisy. Not too stiff. So eight weeks in summer, and then you'd obviously have to fly to Chicago. So um, how painful is it to use a US car rental website? Answer very, very. Yeah. So I think you'd end up with a big Merck SL again because the American muscle cars are very noisy and car sick making. And probably a bit too stiff. So I think you'd end up with a Merck SL for another month. So I reckon you'd spend about five grand on the airfares, even if you went economy, looking at my little Googling this afternoon. When you do this stuff, for the next week, my internet is going to be full of people selling me car hire yep. and in Detroit or Chicago or hotels in Los Angeles anyway. Better than what they usually push you, eh? These are the crosses we have to bear. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's better than sort of expunging your search history. Just go and look for stuff on for the for our two car garage. So I reckon you'd get either the Ferrari six twelve or a five sixty SL for the European trip. Sell that in Rome, left hand drive, make a bit of money. On collecting back. cars. Then you're on collecting cars, obviously, and then you would go to uh, America on the big silver bird in the sky, 
And I think you probably get a car hire of a big Merc SL there. Um, and I reckon the uh, the US bit of the trip, hotels, petrol, could be a lot because you're used to the finer things in life because as we've discovered, if you're getting a three months paid sabbatical, you're not just a student or somebody who's been out of university for a couple of years. No, you're quite senior in your business. So I think you'd be staying in nice establishments all the way down Route 66. 2,000 miles, but you're going to do it a bit zigzaggy, a bit more. So I reckon you're going to spend about £8,000, $8,000 on hotels and petrol and stuff. On the way out, 560 SL or 612, and probably something nice and Merc SL-ish. Not too loud, not too stiff for the Route 66. Oof. Brilliant one, Neil. Oh, he's finished. All right, uh, Neil, um, uh, how are you going to answer this? Right, I am buying a car on uh, collecting cars, actually, because I think you have to, you can't buy a left-hand drive car, which, of course, you need in the UK very exactly. easily. Take it over to bloody Italy and sell it. You're going to get done over like a kipper. So I am going. I am going on collecting cars. I'm, there's only two cars that you can confidently feel that you can buy and then sell, i.e. back to our first conversation about tradable assets cars as currency it's either a porsche or a ferrari everything else big fucking risk yeah. that you'll sit in rome on the side of the street and get done yeah. over hipper by some clever italian bidding you in, in the in the arse so i'm buying a porsche i'd love a 964 i'd love a 993 but basically the air conditioning never works and you're going to be touring around and you won't like a 964 rs um so I'm ignoring Penny's fucking coming sick. She can, I'm going to buy a convertible. She could just throw up out <laughs> over the side of the car. You said so, the question. Are you ignoring your own? <laughs> no, no, no. But, you know, I know Penny more than you do. And that is true. That is you know, true. If she's going to just be a fucking passenger for three months, she's going to have to puke up out the that side. That is a very good point. Because I'm not going to be driving around Europe the best trip of my life in a shit car. So yeah. I'm buying- well, Chris Cooper is, though. He's already done it. Yeah, he's done it, yeah. Nine, uh, that's the trap, you see. Bought a shit car. Uh, yeah. So I'm buying a 997 C2S Cabriolet. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. But I'm getting in oak green metallic because some cool Dutch bloke has ordered one with sort yeah. of terracotta. So it's yeah. going to be easy to sell. They to do some, like green ones in the Netherlands, yeah. Yep, yeah, to some smooth uh, Italian dude in Milan. And actually, I'm going to buy it for 45 and I'm going to sell it for 60 so I'm going to make myself 15 grand, which is going to pay for my, my flights. And then there's only one car that you want to drive Route 66 as a Ford Mustang convertible. Bollocks to Penny again. Yeah. You're, going to, you're going to do six weeks. You're going Absolutely. to all the photos. She's going to have to chuck up uh, over the side. V8, Mustang, Cabriolet. And you've got loads of money because it's only about seven grand to rent the Mustang. And you've made a bit of dosh, so actually you're gonna you're gonna be quids in. You'll come back and buy yourself a Mark One Elise with money you got left. Yeah, <laughs> if only life was that simple. Yeah, um, I have to say, um, yeah, that, that I, I'm with you more than I am on the 560 SL there. I think Chris. Yeah, I'm as well. But I read. The, <laughs> I'm usually for me. I read the question and stuck to it. I, I, I should stick to my usual mode, mode, which is ignore it. it. Mm. Anish, are you going to choose to answer this question or do what Mr. Cooper does and just answer a different question? No, no, no. I'm going to just, I'm saying, I, I did read it exactly the way that Chris did, which is that effectively you've got £50,000 that you can burn on this journey. You don't have to, you can come back £50,000 for her, or if you like, the most you can start with is £50,000. You can never have more than 50000 in the bank. So basically, you've got £4,000 a week or £700 a day to spend. And some of that is on your car, and some of that is on your petrol, and some of that, I assume, is on your hotels. And you've got to make sure you've got enough money for your flights. So um, I actually thought um, of a Mercedes 420 SL, because I was thinking about the petrol. Bobby Ewing. Thinking, sorry? A Bobby Ewing again. Yeah. Yeah. A Bobby Ewing. I think they're fantastic. It's got to get yeah. you to You've got to be able to sell the thing at the other end. And I think if you get a very, very cool black bobby earring with, nice um, with you. tan leather, it's 4.2. So actually, I think it's 28 miles per gallon, something like that combined. Yes. Slowly, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, right, well, Penny mind. gets sick. I was having a little look. <laughs> this is the way. This is a gentle cruise. You know, we're not trying to go too quickly. Yep. It's not too stiff. It's not too soft. 
you can get that the nice big trunk because you're actually traveling we were saying this you know it's eight yeah years. i thought about that you need a boot you need yeah. a boot you really do need a boot so um and that i reckon i reckon you would have about 350 to 400 pounds a night to spend on your hotel yeah so we've been looking at the same website so you can actually eat properly so you get to yeah. Rome. Hopefully, Mercedes still has some value in Rome. You know, some Roman's going to buy it. It's a great looking car. And um, then you've got to fly from Rome to Chicago. Uh, I would actually come via London. There's no way you should go to Italia ever, even if that route exists. That's just not a good airline. No. Okay, I'm afraid to say. So, great livery though for a racing car. Great livery on a rally car. Alitalia, fantastic. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll tell you something. If you're going to take off safely, have some food that you can eat, the plane to land safely, you know, like the crew shouldn't be talking all over the safety briefing, lots and lots of things like this. So you go to Chicago, it's 2,400 miles from Chicago to Santa Monica. You're going to do that in four weeks. And um, I was just having a look, that's 80 gallons of petrol in a Ford Mustang. And America, we're just having a look. Have you seen what it's, it's about four gallon four four dollars a gallon, isn't it? Roughly. Yeah. Something like that. Okay. So there you go. $320 for your uh $320 for your fuel. You've got another $350 3, and dollars sorry, sorry, one thousand two hundred dollars. But you but the bottom line is I've still got four hundred and fifty dollars a night to spend on hotels. I get to LA and I buy my business class because it's a night flight ticket back. I mean, Penny's not that tall, nor am I. We don't need first light, you Neil. We're just, just, we just, we just wallow in a business seat, and um, it's been a wonderful trip. Feel it's been a bird. wonderful <laughs> trip. Um, okay, very considered answer. Edward Lovett, you're going to do something right out of the left field because you've got that impish look. I know something's coming here. Well, sort of. Let, let's see. I've got um, obviously two answers for That's my each, boy. Uh, trip. So, I, my first answer is because I want to be loyal to the first question we had tonight, talking about the S class, and I want to be nice to Penny, and I want to try and get back to London in two months' time, still together. So, I've bought uh, an S five hundred, or if I can afford it on the right deal, an S sixty three Cabriolet. Oh, that's um, a good car. That. That's think, a nice I think, car. I, I think that would. I think it's good on the. Good on the auto routes. I think it's good nice everything. To the roof down, lots of storage. Mm. Um, and then what I'm going to do is seven days before we end in Rome, I'm going to list the car on collecting cars with the oh, oh, oh. calculated mileage. And so it ends on that day. Included in the listing is going to be the flights, hotel, fuel, um, money for fuel, and a channel tunnel crossing to get it back to the UK. So it ends up in London. So it can be sold there. March. Um, and I'm going to tow 50 grand in, 50 grand back out straight away, hop on a plane over to Chicago O'Hare. Now, I went on to the rental websites, and actually, I, I put in a forward date of a couple of months ahead. I couldn't find any Mustangs. I couldn't, I, the only thing I could find with this, actually, I could find a Mustang, a Chevy Suburban. I didn't really yeah. want any of that, but I think I agree with Neil. I think normally you'd want to take um, something like a Mustang as a rental car, but Actually, the site to go on to is Truro. So I went. I saw that, yeah, yeah. So I went on to Truro, and I've rented a 2022 S Class to drive throughout America, and that's going to cost me eight thousand um, dollars. And I'm going to get back with all the factoring in hotels with about six thousand dollars. Now, that should get me a couple of business class seats to get back, but two months in the car with penny it is gonna be over for sure no longer, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. She, she can stay in la and i'll fly back first class yeah, oh, no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i did the, the car i actually wrote uh, down which i think i is i think it's probably a brilliant car to go and do a road car a road tour around europe is, is a box to gts yeah um yeah. Front and rear storage. I, I've never yeah. driven one, but Chris, you said the GTS is probably one of the it's best mega bo boxsters. Yeah, four, um, four liter engine. Yeah. Um, okay, that's a, yeah. That's I looked at that. I thought the car was too small. 
far too small for eight week through Europe. Yeah, no? but fr- fr- front and rear storage is very, yeah. very generous. You get loads I think of- we're discovering Penny won't be allowed to take much luggage with her. So yeah, no. yeah. So, <laughs> Nick, Nick is in the glove box. I'm going to answer the, the question uh, that I thought the answer me. So I thought I thought fifty grand was my capital sum that I could spend. I didn't see it as just. I thought that had to include the budget by the car. So I, I agree, none of the money has to come back. So I thought actually it was a boxer as well, but I couldn't afford in my head a GTS. But I just thought I'd get. The 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 2013 model box are going forward. Is that a nine, eight, seven, or is it? An, I don't know what it is. It's the it's the one that's um, it's a very pretty car, and I think you can get one that's done fifty, sixty thousand miles for about twenty five grand. Um, and you just buy. I'd just buy one in. Uh, I I'd, I'd, I'd buy it online, collecting cars. I'd get a, a Southport, pick it up wherever I needed to in Northern Europe, drive it down to Milan. Um, once we'd done a load of traveling, Penny would be happy in it. You know, the boxes are surprisingly comfortable. If you get one with the smaller wheels, they ride pretty well. You've got lots of luggage space, as Edward says, front and rear. You've got a frunk and a boot. Yeah. Um, you've got a, a really good glove box design that Chris Cooper approves of. And actually, that, that, there's a really usable, livable car. The, the problem is it would create great pressure on the quality of car you had in America because Porsches just work. Everything about them works. So when you go to America, and I totally agree with Neil Clifford, when in Rome, you know, when, when you're in Rome, you don't drink English beer. You know, you, you always drink the local alcohol. You have to. So that means you have to have an American car. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is only a Mustang. And I, was, and I, I love the idea of the H uh, suffix um, Mustangs in the past, the history of the 500H, whatever they call them. The, the idea Hertz. That Hertz, Hertz had their own version of the Mustang. Yeah. They, they bought so many of them and they've just done another one. So it'd have to be the the new 500. They've done a they've done a 500 Mustang H, and it's got 800 and something horsepower, 900 horsepower, and I can get that for about 700 bucks a day, and I, and you can fuel it as well. So that's possible. But Penny, sadly, she doesn't like that car at all. It's it's, it's, going, it's going not to be that noisy, isn't it? Not that noisy, but it doesn't ride well. So she's she's been close to Chandler a couple of times. But as Edward said, we're, we're not getting on, you know, and it's not it's not her fault. I'm just a bit of a wanker, really. And why <laughs> spend it? I listen to my own audio books. I don't want to talk to her. She's well aware of the fact that actually she's spoiling this trip. I'd be much happier on my own. So, so <laughs> May I say to is, the people of the world that Manish and I have bucked the trend of this sort of slightly <laughs> male-centric view of the road trip. I oh, know. Um, so, pennies of the world are safe with us. But she's, Absolutely. you know, really, she's just there to hand me sweets. There's not much, we're not yeah. really talking. It's <laughs> yeah. gone wrong. Um, uh, and so, but she's not getting the message. So to yeah. get the message across, when we get to, uh, when I book the flights from LAX back, uh, <laughs> I, I turn left and she turns right. I really do need um, my sunglasses now. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm literally <laughs> sitting on the pilot's lap and she's back with the chickens and the goats by the toilet. Uh, and we don't even speak going never, You never oh. see her again. No, we don't. Chris, oh, no, Chris, we don't. Chris, 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 I can't let my wife listen to this. No. <laughs> ever, it's ever it's, again. it's entirely fictional. That's not me. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. Oh, yeah. In my life, yeah, I yeah. Yeah. Will believe that. And I yeah. pay for my other half to go to the front. It's fictional. It's not real. Don't yeah. worry about it. Yeah. Good luck with that. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, yeah, it has to be a Mustang. Okay. Mustang, uh, yeah. Now um, I've got my, my roast chicken's going to be overcooked in a minute, so we're, I'm going to have to rush. So we can, we can uh, if you, if we've got time, we'll do music. If not, we'll, well no, we're doing. We're always, always doing music. Doing music. No, this music. Time, music. I think we've been a bit late. At music. It started well, out as tunes to dr- speak for yourself. It started out as tunes to drive to, and what we've ended up doing is pretending that we're all music journalists and we're not. So I want to. I'm going to bring it back to say. Choose, choose your, choose your song. But I want to know the driving circumstances. But I want to know the context of how you would apply that music to yep. driving. Maybe suggest the car you'd be in, or your emotional state, or whatever yep. it is. So Neil Clifford, off you go. Right. I, I will give a real life demonstration. It jumps to mind completely. This existed in my life. It was 1990. Buck one, 1991, I was in a Renault 5 GT Raider. I was driving back every single night. I did 60,000 miles in 18 months in this car from the West End, the Burton Group head office on Burner Street with my mate, Paul. And we would meet, in. We would he would go off to Winchester in a 205 1.9 and I would go over the top from the A34 down in sort of, what's it, 272 and then down almost Peter's yeah. 
down yeah. the A3. They've got the... bloody average speed cameras on the 272 oh. now. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. a lovely yeah. road, a 275, the 272. And I'd be listening to Quadrophenia. I was introduced to Quadrophenia, got three older brothers who are massive Who fans. And that to me is my favorite film, let alone the soundtrack. And I could choose any, any of them on that thing. But I do always remember, and I was singing <laughs> to this because it's Love Rain Over Me, which is the last track, really. It's when Jimmy nicks things, um, Scooter, goes over and just rides it straight over the cliff and kills himself and smashes the scooter right at the end. And I would be happy as a pig in shit, even though I'd worked for 19 hours and I was still not home yet and my mum had run my bath. And that was it. That was, that was a big moment for me. And I remember that song and that's the story. Love it. Chris Cooper. So this is a real thing. So 2016, um, I was driving back from the south of France uh, with a mate, and we were in a red 997 GT3 RS 991 Gen 1. Ooh. And uh, I was with one of my best mates, and we'd been at a track day at Paul Ricard, learning the circuit for a race we were going to go to later that summer. Uh, and my mate was a bit nervous on the trip back because that evening, that Sunday evening, <coughs> was the broadcast of his very first appearance on Top Gear TV. And the mate was... Not the good one, but the bad one. Bugger lugs, yeah. yeah. And the song, and there was a song on the, on the radio when we got back, so just about to the Calais side, and the song was, I think it might have been on your iPod <coughs> or, I, or iPhone, uh, it was Justin Timberlake, Can't Stop the Feeling. Oh, and God. that song summed up a fantastic weekend, a bloke's road trip, dicking around with somebody else's car, who, and the owner of which, Porsche Cars GB, <laughs> didn't know it was in the <laughs> south of France. Wondering why on their tracker, it was going around in very, very fun and squiggly circles in the same place, south of France. <laughs> and we drove back in one hit. It was just a perfect weekend feel good. And that song stuck me ever since. Ever I hear it, I just feel good of that wonderful weekend with my mate. A good, good pop song that is, and uh, yeah, I'm a bit weepy there. Um, Ed would love it. So, late nineties, got my driving license, and whenever I found a girl that would show half a bit of interest in me, it didn't really matter where she was in the country, but I would get in the car after work <laughs> and drive to wherever <laughs> she was to try and get my well leg over. <laughs> and you know, sometimes it was local, other times <laughs> it wasn't. And, you know, you pumped up after work, you'd want to go. So I was listening back in those days to Ministry of Sound and the the, the annuals that came out. And yes, no, 1996 Ministry of Sound annual was done by Boy George and Judge Jules. And I was trying to, I, I, I think I've now found it on Spotify, but I remember I had it in cassette, cassette form. And my first car was a Nissan Sunny 1.4 LX with a rear spoiler. And I treated, my, I treated myself to a mini disc player. And I got to all of the cassette stuff and put it onto my mini discs and made play, uh, playlists on my, on my mini discs. Hmm. And, this, and, and I fa found the song and I was listening to it over the, the weekend. And it's called Beach Ball by Nalene and Kane. Uh, it's quite a long track, but... I was listening to it today on the way to the airport, thinking this is brilliant. It took me back, and uh, yeah, I will. I don't have that opportunity to do it anymore. <laughs> oh, Minute there we go. Oh, the emotional oh. journey continues. Uh, Manish, but, what are you going to have? But but, but, what, but when I leave, but when I leave Penny, obviously in LA, and it is, I'll, I'll be putting it. I'll be playing it again on the way back from the yeah, airport in London. Exactly. Um, uh, Manish. A uh, piece of music we always listen to when we arrive in Tobago, which is actually where I am. Um, it's by David Rudder, and um, it's called Trini to the Bone. And um, it's it's like an unofficial Trinidadian and Tobagonian national anthem. And that the words are, welcome, welcome, one and all, to the land of Fet, Trini to the Bone, Bago to the Bone. And it's wonderful. You just drive around on these beautiful, beautiful roads here, full of potholes, but God, there are some lovely lefts and rights and ups and downs and hugging mountains and things like that. Listening to David Rudder, you feel alive, man, you feel alive. 
Oh, I think we're all just terribly jealous now. Are you doing uh, accents again, Manish? Yes. Sorry, yes. This one I'm probably not allowed to use. You're right. No, that You're is right. not allowed to do that. Good, though. Um, so... Uh, than my Indian accent. Everyone's been very upbeat, so I'm going to, ch- I'm going to change mine. So I'm... I'm I'm Because I'm always a glass half-empty, miserable bastard, anyway. I think... Um, Penny, we've got back from... I, I've had a moment where I've gone through immigration, Penny fucked off left and I've gone right. And I've got into the car and I've had a moment of thinking, have I got this wrong? Maybe actually I'm just a complete wanker and, and, and actually she could have been the woman for me and I'm not good enough for her. So I'm, I'm, I'm thoughtful, I'm, I'm pensive and, I, and I, I've turned on my... I've turned on my... I'm in my, my old portion, I've turned on my Alpine head unit and it's got, and it's got that lovely green glow. There's look, that green of the Alpine head. Mm. And I've thought... I know what I want. I want something to be a little bit morose, maybe a tearjerker. I'm going to go Smashing Pumpkins 1975, which I think is a fantastic driving tune if you're just a bit below the weather and you you want to wallow in self-pity. It's a great self-pity song. Um, Okay, so... uh, You dumped a girl after being completely unchivalrous and you've put on the music because you feel sorry for yourself. But okay, I'm a man. No, I, that's, that's how it works. That's, yeah. what, that's what blokes do, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, they make right. they make their own guess. mistakes, then they blame everyone else. That's what called us just being a man. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, thank you to my co-host. Just, just sorry, just just very quickly. I've just he does this text. every time. I, I've just had a text message from Clever Jason, who uh, has decided he wants to correct us all because our two car garages last week for the two daughters was wrong, uh, and he said the right answer is a car that I think he bought off collecting cars. Uh, which is this? Yeah, one hundred. Uh, is that yeah. a Serena? That that is a yeah Toyota oh, Sierra, a um, which with with the Serena. same doors uh, as McLaren F1, confirmed by Gordon Murray. And he there's says a, there's here, a rumor it's a, that he needs that engine rebuilt. Which one of the Sierra? Yeah, <laughs> there is a uh, rumor. Anyway. So Clever Jason is correcting us. That's Clever not Jason saying that we weren't work. good enough last week. Um, <laughs> and on that on, on that bombshell, uh, I want to say goodbye from myself and my co-host, I would love it, Manish Pandy, Neil Clifford, uh, and Chris Cooper. So we'll see you next week. And go on to the YouTube channel because there's actually a video up of a car skidding round, not just five men talking shit. Bye-bye. Bye.